chill They say I'm crazy I really don't care That's my prerogative They say I'm crazy I'm here Thank You're you for here. your patience Yes, uh, I made it Yeah, dude, it's good seeing you, man You as well, man Thanks, That's man Hey, my headphones make me look like I got a blue ribbon mullet I love this <laughs> yeah. It's Samus to that, so I got the bi level Yes <laughs> My headphones barely yeah. fit Because I got like, you know, corn head from corn You know, they call them head You know, I can no, be related dude, to them, you know it's a high intellect. There's a lot. There's a yeah, lot of there's story. A lot. Going. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're uh you're fresh off the boat, off the cruise. How did that go? It was amazing. You know, um, it was uh, the fifth one, and you know, I think the first time that Jericho said, "Hey, I want to do a cruise." There's, you know, it's the entertainer cruise is the way of the future for you know festivals and you know. Uh, Obviously, uh, it's basically a comic con on on the on the water. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's really cool. It's like everyone who loves wrestling and rock and roll is on it, and the boat's been sold out. And um, yeah, I mean, the only way that I can kind of say it is is the same way when we go to Europe and do these festivals uh, that are kind of destination festivals. Everybody there is so excited. They've you know, plan for this thing for a year. Everybody's excited and it's, it has an energy that's different yeah. from a regular club show or uh, anything else. It's very unique. So we, we've had fantastic shows and um, Fozzy played three shows. Guardians played three shows. Uh, PJ Farley, our bass player in Fozzy, he's in a band. Also his band Trickster, they played two shows. Um, and then he also played in Jericho's uh, Kiss tribute band quarantine. So all of us are, you know, we're having fun and um, having a great vacation, but we're also working our asses off and uh, <laughs> multiple sets. And you've known me long enough to know that uh, I don't phone in the gigs. I, I no. work really hard, and uh, so I probably burnt uh, I don't know uh, ten thousand calories a day just uh, doing it up. Hey, I see you got a remix bump box. I've got one of those yes. as well. I love oh, you those. Do? Yeah, of oh, course. Oh, sweet. So you got one too. I, I got a, a Snoop Dogg one and this one. So I've, now I have a Ooh. collection. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big Bump Box fan. When we did the uh, Sane video, uh, which was on the roller coaster, for those who don't know about it, uh, we Fozzie did a music video on a moving roller coaster. And we were trying to figure out how to get a loud playback unit on the roller coaster. So I bought um, uh, one of the. It, it's the remix is kind of a smaller, medium size bump box, yeah, it is. but I got, yeah. I got the flare eight, which is the big one. And we got a professional rigger that, that mounted the, uh, bump box flare eight to the inside of the, that was our playback unit. And I had my phone tucked in my sock and push play as we're going up and we did the music video using a bump box. It was fantastic. Yeah. I still have it. Yeah. It's my, uh, yeah. my dressing room. Get ready for the show jams. It's cool. <laughs> is it blasting while you're on that roller coaster? I mean, is it like, do you have it just really, really super loud while you're going down this roller coaster? It was all the I mean, way up. It's yeah. almost too still, Yeah. Yeah. It's just blaring well, at you. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going 70 miles per hour. So, and oh, okay. remember, it's not just me and Jericho that has to hear it. It's the guys who are three cars behind us in the band who have to hear it as well. I mean, it's most important for Chris because obviously he's the one who he's got to do the uh, lip sync, the lyrics in the music video. The rest of us were just headbanging and trying not to vomit on the sixth <laughs> time in a row. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're talking about videos. Uh, our boy Trevor just filmed a video for you guys. Um, that's coming out soon, right? I don't even know what song it is or anything, but I know Trevor's worked on good company. Yeah. I, 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 I met Trevor because he's part of the Nathan Mowry um, collective of genius, freaking just cool artists um filmmakers and i obviously i know them through you as well and yeah, um trevor did a photo shoot for the guardians about three years ago and uh the reason i wanted trevor to do the guardians new music video is because he's an 80s fanatic his favorite thing is 80s aesthetic he loves the colors the 
he loves everything about the 80s. It's the nostalgia and um, the music, the look, the films, TV. I knew he was the right guy to do it because it's, you know, when you're shooting a music video, it's not just, uh, is it lit well? Um, you know, do you have a good camera and do we have a good concept? The idea is, is somebody inspired by the idea of, and it has a passion to want to do this because um, as you and I have been in this business for a very long time, um, you need to surround yourself with people who understand your vision and who want to be in your cult. Um, you want them drinking Kool-Aid with you and uh, believe in, in the same mission statement. Um, we, so the crazy thing about the Guardians when I started this band three years ago was that I just made the assumption that you do a tribute band the same way you would do every other band I've ever been in, Stuck Mojo and Fozzie, and you record some demo songs, you record, uh, you film some videos. But what I found out is a lot of the talent buyers all over the country and in Europe, they want what's called sizzle reels. So they basically want highlight reels. They want a combination of six or seven songs, um, and uh, into one, you know, two minute, basically mm -hmm. a highlight reel. Um, I guess it would be the same thing if you were a wrestler. You would say, hey, instead of sending me a video of one of your matches, you would send them a highlight reel of like 10 matches. Here's this and this and this. And it made sense. It's just I wasn't prepared. It's this, this, um, this Guardians of the Jukebox adventure has been uh, an education uh, for me as well. I mean, part of it is... I'm making music with my best friends, just like I do with Fozzie, just like I did in Stuck Mojo. We're a gang. The second thing is, is trying to understand the environment. Um, when Stuck Mojo started, we were two black guys and two white guys playing hip hop metal in a world coming out of the late 80s where the most popular bands were, um, you know, Warrant and, you know, Skid Row. And like, we just, we were trying to navigate a landscape that, was new and thank God for the Chili Peppers. Thank God for Faith No More that there was some bands kind of doing things that were related to us, although they were cousins. We were able to kind of navigate that. And then with with Fozzy, we started off doing um, basically what Steel Panther is doing now, which is that we are wearing costumes and wigs and playing cover material and trying to figure out what does members of Stuck Mojo and a professional wrestler, Chris Jericho, do to find their way and navigate, um, you know, making records and touring? And so luckily for me, um, although I haven't climbed Everest, I've climbed other mountains, uh, metaphorically. Mm -hmm. You know, I know the process of um, and I know that everything is an opportunity for learning and growth, but I have the basic tools that I need to make. Guardians, a huge band, in the same way that Stuck Mojo and Fozzie was a grind, but we got there. Um, nobody thought that uh, me and uh, uh, Chris Jericho from the WWE would ever have a gold album on our wall, and and they were probably right. We probably shouldn't have, but yeah. the reason that it worked was because uh, Chris and I are both not the kind of guys that sit at base camp too, boiling water with the Sherpas. We're going north. We're headed for the yes. summit. Even if it means we lose a foot on the way to frostbite, we are going to the summit. That's how we're built. That's how we're wired. Um, and my my feelings towards the Guardians are the same. I don't ever do anything. Uh, I played in a couple of other bands. I've done gigs with other groups along the way. But unless it's something that I feel like I can go to Everest, the, the summit with, I, I just really don't have any interest in it. I, I always tell people that, um, if, if I'm, I will never put the pads on and put a helmet on unless my goal is to go to the Super Bowl. Like, yeah. I just don't even want to be second best at anything. It's like not, it's, and I don't even mean it's success wise as in what kind of car is in my driveway or how many albums have I sold. Success to me is, is relative to what my goals are for me and my gang. Um, you know, are we making music we love? Are we having great shows? Are we getting the best out of ourselves as a group? And so working with Trevor seemed like the right next step for us to put together this highlight reel. We filmed at a roller skating rink 
um, because there's nothing more eighties than going to the roller skating rink. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just synonymous with that culture. And, um, and we invited a, a club of, uh, in Gwinnett County, uh, that is roller skating enthusiast and had them skating while we were performing. So we filmed, uh, us doing nine songs. And then we also did a music video for, uh, what a feeling. Uh, the flash dance oh, theme song, great. which Irene Cara, because um, we we've already done music videos for My Prerogative, Electric Avenue, and Caribbean Queen, and since we did those videos, we were really fortunate to um, find that elusive, um, you know, white unicorn. We we've been looking for this female keyboard player who could really round us out as a band because. Um, myself and Grant Brooks, uh, who's the drummer in Fozzy, he and I are heavy metal kids from birth and our, our male singer and our bass player came up in the Atlanta music scene in a band called Salem Ash and they were big mm. prog guys. So they came up Queens Reich, um, dream theater, uh, Dixie dregs. So we have a bunch of goofy musicians that are all dudes wanting to play rock and we needed a real female artist. We didn't need Ann Wilson from Heart. We didn't need Pat Benatar. We needed a uh, Annie Lennox from the Eurythmics. We needed no. a nice counterbalance. We needed someone who was sophisticated and that had that side of the 80s that was more of the, that what Annie Lennox meant to the 80s, which was great because it's a great counterbalance to the gold. Like I said, she's like a sophisticated pure breed and we're a bunch of uh, mutts over there jumping around uh, and and the band is it's the perfect it is a it really is a perfect band and it really for us is um continuing to figure this out like you would any band that's the beautiful thing about me doing this twice already is that i know what that process is you rehearse you're writing you're recording you're figuring each other out because it's all chemistry and how to how do I complement this person and how do they complement me and my weaknesses need to be overcome by the strengths of my other bandmates and every great band there ever was. That's how it worked, whether it was Led Zeppelin or it was The Who or it was uh, Snoop Dogg and his posse. Surround yourself with people that make you better by filling in the gaps and the holes that you maybe need improving on. Yeah, that's a big thing, surrounding yourself with good people. And it sounds like you have a great group of people. Uh, how did you find your keyboardist, Kara? Am I saying her name right, Kara? Yeah, Kara, yeah, yeah. This um, is like, yeah, keep going. No, so uh, I, I just did this thing where I reached out to a bunch of people I know in the Atlanta area. One of them was Scully from Scully Entertainment. Oh, yeah, he knows yeah. every, yeah, of course. Uh, he knows yeah, everybody. Scurdle. Yeah, of course. Uh, he's he's been a long time friend and he came up in bands and he's a promoter. I asked him, he gave me some names. Uh, and there was that thing where you use social media, you're asking people who are the people around town. It was kind of important to find someone in Atlanta because otherwise you're asking someone to relocate. Um, and that complicates things. And I was just lucky that after three or four conversations with different people, uh, our manager, so we're managed by two people. One of them is Mark Willis, who manages Fozzie mm -hmm. uh, and managed Stuck Mojo before that. And the other gentleman's name is Randy Sod, who you may know Randy Sod. He's, he worked for Itchy Bond Records in the 90s, and then he went on to manage a bunch of bands. Uh, he, he, um, uh, and he also is a radio marketing guy. He actually got a part of Fozzie's radio marketing team. So he's been part of our family for a long time. And Randy knew of her because he saw her at a local Atlanta showcase at Smith's Soul Bar. And he said, I got your girl. I got her. And, um, you know, I had to convince her that I wasn't a lunatic um, because I had grand plans. And everybody comes to you, right? Like, I'm sure yeah, yeah. you've heard it a million times. You know what we're going to do? Let me tell you what I'm going to do. Like, yeah. Everybody thinks everybody yeah. thinks like they're going to be big or this is going to happen. And um, and I told her, I was like, um, when I first met her, I was like, the reason I know that Guardians of the Jukebox are going to be successful fans because I've done it twice under impossible odds. Like it was never supposed to be. Stuck Mojo was 
before Seven Dust. Thank God for them, they blew yeah. the doors down to allow multiracial rock bands to kind of be on the radio. We were traveling in really uncharted areas and a lot of times it just takes people kicking doors down before it normalizes what that looks like you know and it doesn't mean it's good or bad or whatever it, it, it's um i didn't even have any judgment on whether people should have accepted us or not there's just like the same way that if um you know a, a bunch of guys from the philippines came in and they were in a reggae band it doesn't look what like what people think it should look like right you know people have a stereotype of what things are supposed to look like and sound like and you just have to prove them wrong. And I, I'm, and so for me, I just love overcoming those odds. So that the, I told people from day one with the Guardians, if we're not playing Chastain Park, then I've failed. Like if we're not headlining amphitheaters, I'm not interested in the, the reason that we play clubs now is what I call beta testing. I want to play every club that'll have us say thank you so much. I want to figure out how this works. Get this band good. Stuck Mojo did it. We spent years at the rec room, the Samba Reptile. Yeah, we, we played any great. place that would have it. Yeah, that's right. We never said no. We never cared about the money. We never cared about anything. All we wanted to do was make those four dudes on the stage the most powerful force in our business. And that's all I want to do with the Guardians is find out what songs work for us. Find out how we work better together as a live band. And and we do a big multimedia package with video and how that works. Yeah. And, That's the know, best video background. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Thank you. For someone that's never seen you guys play live, how would you describe your your style, the, the kind of songs you guys play for someone that's never heard of you or never seen you? Like, what can they expect if they see you play? Well, the we're just show. the best. We're just the best cover band anyone's ever seen. Um, right. And part of that just kind of comes down to. Um, <laughs> I always try to explain it to people that um, it's not necessarily that we're talent. You know this. You talk to people in the business all the time and you're in the business. Talent really doesn't mean a lot. So if I say we're the best cover tribute band, it's not me doing this because it doesn't mean whether somebody can play like Eddie Van Halen or someone can sing like Lionel Richie or someone can sing like Madonna or play drums like the drummer from Toto. None of that matters. What matters is, is when people come to see you play, they feel like they've seen something special. They feel like they've built a relationship with what they're seeing. So there's tons of people who are talented who will go down and on a Saturday night play the Dixie Tavern and blow the doors off the place, yeah. but they just played those songs good. Mm. And be, being good is just such a small part of this. And we know that because there's so many rap artists and pop artists and rock and roll and heavy metal artists. They weren't the best. They weren't the best guitar player or best singer. It really just came down to people who understand how to build relationships with audiences. And it, it's also people that are willing to do whatever it takes to put on the most incredible show possible. And, you know, I always know going into any endeavor that um, it, in this business, that if you're not willing to take every item that you own and every dollar from your bank account and set it in the middle of the floor and set it on fire. I mean, it's, that's the gamble for any musician or any artist or filmmaker, anything you want to do this. It is an all or nothing proposition. And most people, and this is no disrespect to most tribute bands or no disrespect to other, but they're not willing to do. It's this, it's the same reason I always say people are like, man, God, man, you, you know, you're 55 years old, man. You're still making music. I was like, yeah, because it's freaking hard. It's hard to continue to make music because it's not hard to play guitar. It's not hard to do gigs. It's when COVID happens and there's no working for two years. And then you have to figure out what are you going to do? And when the 2008 crisis hit and the, the entire music business contracted and everything kind of slowed down, what are you going to do? And then when 9-11 happened and the whole business froze for six or eight months. And when two record companies folded on me and all the money they owed, they kept. They just filed bankruptcy on us. Then people just say, I've had enough. I'm just going to get out of this. 
And not to mention the first part of it, which is that do you want to ride around for four years in a 1977 Dodge van for no money and sleep on people's floors after the show that'll let you and basically live like, a, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to make, I'm not even going to say being homeless is bad. It's, it's for a lot of people, um, it's no choice of theirs. It's terrible circumstances that have put them in this. Most musicians have to choose to be homeless. If you don't have rich parents that are bankrolling you or you don't have the, the, the fortunate um, uh, just whatever luck to on your yeah. fifth show you played and you got a record deal, most people just spend years. I, listen, I've known Morgan Rose my entire life. Like we both, like, we lived like animals, like n no money and no, but you never even thought about it. Why? Because this is what we're meant to do. This is my purpose. Yes. I don't want to. I don't want to. That's it. I don't want to do this for the fame or the money. I'm supposed to play guitar. Whatever it takes. Circle back around. I'm not hanging around at base camp two with the Sherpas boiling water and talking about ah, it's bad weather up above. The people who make it in this business are the ones that just say, eh, well. We're just going to the top. And if the Sherpas want to hang out in the tent while you head to the top, if we don't make it, you know, you know, give me the little prayer when you walk by my frozen body on the side of the road, on the side of the path. When you go up to the top, that's that's the gamble that all musicians take. Um, and in the tribute band business, it's populated by mainly people who tried doing original music when they were young, got hard, didn't in their mind, make it, whatever that is. And they decided to put together a Motley Crue tribute band or something like that. And then they could play on the weekends, have fun. And there's nothing wrong with that, dude. There's yeah. so many cool tribute cover bands that kick ass. And those oh, guys work, guys and girls work Monday through Friday and have, and they do it like they, like it's their golf game. I love to play golf. So I work my ass off Monday through Friday so I can have a golf membership on Saturday. <laughs> Same thing like, a tribute bands. My tribute band's different. My tribute band is populated by people who have been in the game, who have done it, and who love this thing. And it's a, you know, we could have started another, um, we could have started another original band, uh, and or I could have just gone and got it on my knees and tried to tell the guys in Stuck Mojo we should do this again for the twentieth <laughs> time. We should try it. <laughs> um, but something magic happened to me. Um, uh, Artemis Pyle, who is the mm, former drummer from Leonard Skinner. Yeah. Um, Randy Sod, who is the Guardians manager, uh, four years ago, put together a tribute show and asked me if I would play guitar and help organize the band um, to raise money for Bob. The other. So so in Leonard Skinner, Artemis Pyle played on Freebird and Bob played on uh sweet home alabama there were two different kind of eras for drumming now artis artemis is the famous guy because he's crazy he was yeah. like the personality um and so we were raising money bob had passed away and we were going to raise some money for his family so um so the idea was to play a bunch of covers eagles stones uh skinnard um just play a southern rock old school classic rock set with some local musicians. Um, and I was like, well, you know, I'm not really into the kind of the idea to do the covers. It was so much fun to be up there. Jericho was there, a bunch of other local musicians, Artemis on drums. And I was just like, oh yeah. Like this, I, it was like, I don't know, like hang gliding or something the first time in your life. And you say, oh, this is my jam now. I got to, you know, I got to do this now. And that's the way I felt about this cover thing because, you know, I am, a, as I said earlier, I'm a 55 year old man. I, I was in high school in the eighties. I eighties music meant everything to me because that was my discovery. You know, that period of time when you're 12 years old until you're 18, that's prime. Oh yes. Everything is music. Yeah. Unless you, unless you want to be a professional athlete, then baseball is your thing. But for me as a kid, I went to every concert. 
Maiden, Priest, Ozzy, Scorpions, Bon Jovi. I went to everything. I never missed a concert. It didn't matter what kind of style, what style it was. Went to Michael Jackson. I saw every Huey Lewis in the news. The B- B- Brian Adams. Like, I just loved music. I had a love affair. I was a just one of those kids that just loved music. And, and even though I was a heavy metal kid growing up, MTV was the thing. I remember MTV started in 1981 and we didn't get cable until 82. But I remember every day I would come home from school and turn on MTV. And it was the most incredible thing because it wasn't like it was like in the early 90s where things were kind of uh, tribal. Yo MTV Mm -hmm. raps, Headbangers Ball. When you watched MTV in the early 80s, it was just everything. There wasn't like Alternative Nation. It was like Madonna. (laughs) Just one show. Talking. Talking Heads, everything, <laughs> and everybody loved everything. So I know all these songs, like, and picking out the set list for the Guardians, and this is like one of the most fun things I'd ever done was sitting down and going, okay, I got my gang of, of players. Let's start looking at songs. We start going through the Billboard charts. What were the big songs? What were the songs that were played the most on MTV? Looking at Spotify plays. What are the songs that people are still listening to now on Spotify? And getting all this kind of analytics to figure out. Because a lot of bands, too, they just play their favorite songs. Then you end up having like half a set full of deep cuts. And the the audience is like, I get it. You like that song. You know, go see most tribute bands or cover bands and they're always playing the songs they like, man, let's play, you know, and, and, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that, but let's find the song that the band loves that they also play well. Cause that's the thing about it. This is that uh, just because I love uh, smooth criminal doesn't mean I should play smooth criminal because Michael Jackson has the narrowest of most specific <laughs> thumbprints the sound of his voice, the way that he um, articulates and his rhythm. When you look at the Guardian set list, there's some things you won't see. Prince, Michael Jackson, um, uh, the Talking Heads. There are some very specific artists. I'm not saying we never will, but you must tread on those uh, um, or undertake those songs and those artists with great reverence. Because it's not mm-hmm. like you want to copy them. I, I can only play guitar like Rich Ward. I learned the notes. I learned what was done on the originals. And I played them the way I would. Because I am I am me. I'm, when I play Africa, I don't play it like Steve Lukather. Because I can't. Because Steve Lukather is a way better guitar player at playing in Toto than I would be. Just like Steve Lukather wouldn't want to play in Stuck Mojo. Because that wouldn't be his thing. So I mm-hmm. try to figure out how... Do I intersect? These are like, we have crazy philosophical discussions about how do we as musicians intersect with these and where are areas that we, we shouldn't veer too far away. And we don't want to make them ours. They already belong to the world. You don't want to reinvent a song like Summer of 69 or, or, or Like a Prayer by Madonna. Everybody knows those songs so intimately they must not be tampered with. You must play them the yeah. way people remember them. And at the same time, we are who we are. So you color within the lines, but you use the, the color crayons that you feel are appropriate for you. So it's been an, it's been an incredible um, education, learning how to play th- like these other artists. Um, and also it's another fantastic thing. We all do it. I mean, look at you. Like you've, you went from being a drummer to one of the biggest podcasters, you know, no, on YouTube. Appreciate that. And yet, so you think about it. It's like, you're still playing drums. I still play in mm-hmm. Fozzie, but you found new outlets for your creativity. And I think that's what truly creative people do. They're looking at new ways to challenge themselves, but things that interest them, things that they're good at. And I think, you know, you found podcasting and I found, you know, playing Kenny Loggins songs. And it's, um, <laughs> and I think that's the goal for all of us is as we get older to keep us from accumulating moss, we have to keep moving and just figuring yes. out new ways to challenge ourselves and also new ways to, to feel alive. And that's, uh, we do forever young, um, uh, we do both Alphaville and Rod Stewart. We 
Um, <laughs> I, yeah. Combine and, them. And, and yeah. That's, yeah. And it's my favorite moment of the set because it is such a reminder. Man, when I look at when I look at photographs of my dad when he was fifty five, he, he just looked like 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 the oldest of the oldest man I could ever think of. <laughs> Same here. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? Like, and yeah, I think yeah. part of it, and I think part of it is, is that there was this kind of understanding that if your choice in life was to, you know, you were going to raise a family, you were going to go to work and there was a certain thing and, and there was a kind of a mindset of what, what a family looked like and what a life looked like. And I think things have changed um, over the years but I think it's also a personal choice. I mean, we can look at guys from and girls from 30, 40 years ago that they looked younger. But I think it was all about just living in the moment and waking up every day saying, I'm going to be doing things that make me happy and things that excite me and chase my dreams and never, never just think of myself as a cog you know in the grind in the meat grinder yeah. um and i've i've created a life for myself that is is exactly what i love i wake up i i do 30 minutes of yoga i play guitar and the day is mine to be creative and write music and if i'm on tour then i it's similar schedule minus the fact that i get to play every night and and sometimes that means there's uh you know, uh, three or four months where we're all thinking, oh, my God, how are we going to make it? Because this tour didn't sell as well as the other or, you know, blame it on streaming or whatever you want to do. But the industry just contracts in certain ways. And you just have to say it doesn't matter. Pure motives. Why are you doing this? Are you doing it because you want a nice car in the driveway and you want things? Or are you doing it because this is who you are? And. Luckily for me, my wife has allowed me to be irresponsible for the 21 years that she's been with me, and wow, allows me 21 to. Years. Yeah, yeah. I, I sleep in, and then she's never. Um, uh, it's time to get up. It's never any of that. It's that she she's knows that I'm one of Peter Pan's lost boys, and I'm never going to grow up. And I'm always just going to. Yeah, and I'm always going to be if, for for better or worse. You know, <laughs> hey, I got some uh, some things I was wanting to show you too. Uh, my son met you at Southern Honor Wrestling. Do you still go there? Look at this. Of course. Yeah. Oh man, that's awesome! I see yeah, you yeah. every week. I see you every month at Southern Honor Wrestling because yeah, you're always time. on yeah. the screens. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, yeah. Run the ads yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to meet Jake the Snake that night, so he was pretty pretty happy about that. Do you still uh, help out at at the running sound and everything? Yeah, I do. I, you know, they've, my job up there with Southern Honor and also my church, which is Action Church in Canton, my job there is basically um, the, the pastor, Gary, uh, allow, he, which, who runs the wrestling and is the pastor who, it, it's just wow, couldn't be any cool. more fan. Yeah, I mean, the coolest guy ever. Um, he's allowed uh, the church to be, uh, Fozzie and the Guardians and Stuck Mojo's home base. So when we rehearse, when we uh, are organizing for tours and things, he allows us to use his building um, to basically call our you know, our home base. And then in exchange, whenever he needs something, he needs me to run sound at wrestling. He needs me to run sound at church. He needs anything. Um, I'm there as his guy who can help out as someone who understands sound and has been around the show business for a lot of years, he knows he can call me at any time and I'll be there in any way that I can help. And, um, he's actually promoting, uh, you know, concerts and he's, he's had, we've stuck Mojo Fozzie and the guardians have all played the action building, which is, um, uh, which Amazing. is a church on Sunday, which is also yeah, it's a church. I yeah. know. It's, it's fantastic. Oh, right. um, yeah. So it's, you know, and as you know, cause you know it as well as anybody, this business is just about relationships and that's all it is. Networking. You yeah. find people that you love, you find people that you want to break bread with and you want to share your time with and those are the people you stick with. 
Yes, amen to that. And and it, the longevity, and it, it can tell with your band now. I mean, you guys get along so well, and it just seems so. I don't know, man. It just seems great, and you can tell how long you've been doing this for. That it's just paying back now. You know, you're you're wiser. <laughs> it's like, you've always been wise. You've always been the man. Uh, I'll, I'll no, I, I, I actually I, I actually haven't been wise, but it it, it uh, I've done so many <laughs> terribly dumb things, but I, I'm glad that I have the scars to show them from. <laughs> I remember when you uh, you were telling me you were cutting grass one summer, you know, between Suck Mojo and Fozzie. Yeah, yeah, 2005. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. I, got this, I, mean, yeah. I got I got this too. Uh, what a crazy night this was. The best I mean, uh, night. I've got mine too. Yes. I got to get you to autograph this, man. I got Morgan to sign it. But I I'd had Morgan to. Rose in, in head. Yeah, what a crazy night that was, man. Talking about 80s. And, you know, I, I actually thought that was, it was it was pretty amazing. I mean, I, I, you know, obviously, I don't know Head as well as you do. I, I've met him through I, you. Yeah. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, I mean, I remember... We played in the first time I ever heard of corn. Um, we were in Raleigh, North Carolina, and there was a band that was opening for Stuck Mojo in 1992 called Corn with the C. Whoa. And what they was got, with a C? Uh, yeah, it was with a C. And the, the uh, bass player in the band told me, yeah, we're going to have to change our name because there's another corn in California. It's spelled with a K, but their attorney reached out to us and they have a trademark on it. And they're, they were a killer band. We played with them a couple of times, but their thing was they would, you know, it was, you know, it, a little too on the nose, but they would throw popcorn in the crowd. And they were kind of, um, you know, that was the beginning of that alternative rock, alternative metal era. So everybody was starting to get funky. Everybody was loving the Chili Peppers. Everybody was loving Pantera. Any bands that grooved or had funk elements. That was the beautiful thing about the, the kind of early 90s. It was everybody was exploring those new elements, which is obviously where um, so much of that new metal came from, uh, you know, which we were you know, lucky to be a part of that wave as well with Stuck Mojo. Were you ever into the grunge movement, like with the Nirvanas and, and you know, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains? <laughs> Very short. Um, so in 92, I went to Lollapalooza and saw that incredible grunge lineup at Lollapalooza, which was Pearl Jam was second. Tool was first. Pearl <laughs> Jam was second. And then um, I believe Ice Cube was next. And then it was Soundgarden. And uh, and then it was Ministry. Uh, it was like yeah, I mean, I saw like the greatest bands of all time all there. And I love Pearl Jam's, uh, that 10 album by Pearl oh, Jam. Yeah. I think it, it's almost a perfect album. Uh, and obviously, I love Bad Motor Finger. I thought Bad mm. Motor Finger is probably the, my probably my favorite grunge record of that era. I mean, it was perfect storm of guys who were doing grunge, but also there were some hard rock metal influences, enough Sabbath stuff in there that I was... It was perfect, and it was produced by Terry Date, who was doing Pantera stuff. So oh, yeah. it sounded incredible. Um, so that was like, yeah, I love that stuff. I mean, I loved Alice in Chains. I mean, they, I, so I didn't like is the, once it got a little of the alternative stuff, uh, the alternative grunge stuff was it wasn't my favorite. I liked the stuff that was more kind of heavy guitar driven. I was a guitar player. I loved aggressive riffing. So those were the bands that I gravitated more towards. And I love Pearl Jam, even though they weren't necessarily a heavy band. I love them because their stage energy was just unparalleled. Uh, on that tour in particular, it was like, it was like the Chili Peppers. It was, you know, four out of the five band members were going absolutely crazy and losing their minds. And there was so much energy. And yeah, I mean, that was, that was the beautiful thing about that era was like everything was happening. You know, at the same yeah. time, you God, know, it was like hip, -hop, hip hop was incredible in that early 90s. And yeah. um, it was just a great time to be alive uh, musically because there it was uh, it was almost at that period of time where you didn't have to be part of a scene like, mm. you know, like in the 80s. Who are you? Uh, right. what, what do you mean? Well, you, you had to fit into a category. And in the early mid nineties, it was just kind of open season to just do whatever, be expressive, do your thing. Because even though people would call smashing pumpkins grunge, it really wasn't. It was yeah, like, yeah. it was its own thing. Um, 
and you know you didn't even know where to put nine inch nails or ministry like you know and then mid 90s it was like holy mackerel you had um fear factory and machine head and all of these exciting bands that were influenced by pantera and sepultura and were the the evolution from that metal it was just it's fantastic and then devin townsend was strapping and lad and I mean, to be in the mix with all of that and playing shows with all of them, touring with those bands. I mean, Stuck Mojo toured with Typo Negative and Life of Agony and Pantera, yeah, Testament, uh, 24-7 Spies. And we just, we were so lucky. And then Fozzie has done tours with Metallica and has done festivals with, I mean, we, we, we were the opening band on Motorhead's 30th anniversary show in Hollywood at the third at, at mm. Wiltern Theater. We opened for Iron Maiden at, at a stadium in LA, like uh, main support. We've just done. You incredible. toured with Pantera. I, Don't forget that. Toured I know. With Pantera. I know. Yeah. Toured with Pantera in Europe. <laughs> I stood. We. I played a festival, a uh, festival tour in Australia, and I stood next to to James Hetfield. <laughs> watching slayer play on side stage it's like i've just been like i don't even know like every night we played with pantera i'd look on the side of the stage and there was dying bag and phil every night watching us and yes i've had a i've had an incredible life and um, and and, and I don't mean to cut you off, but you you were sober for most of these days because you don't you're not a big partier, so you actually remember these things. It's not like that blurry night, you I, know, with, with the Pantera or whatever. I was, band, you know? for a, I was sober for all of it. Yeah, yeah, that's I've, great. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, part of it was a uh, people always ask me, "You never partied?" I was like, "Yeah." Somebody had to drive the van, like <laughs> yeah. you know, like it's that that's same true. little thing that you hear. It's like. When you're in a band full of people who are having a good time, somebody's got to get you to the next gig, you know, sober. And it kind of became my job um, that I was the one to check us into the hotels. And I was that person. And it's it suited me because I was kind of a loner kid growing up. I didn't have an older brother or sister that was a partier who introduced me to that lifestyle. I didn't. Yeah have any friends in the neighborhood who ever had parties that i came over to no one was like showing me how to smoke weed at an early age or something i just wasn't around it so you know the the kind of gateway to that lifestyle was not even around i was in the boy scouts i i went to the skateboard park every saturday um i played dungeons and dragons on sundays at a hobby shop like i was quintessential kind of nerd kid um, mm -hmm. I listened to my records by myself in my room. I didn't, you know, I played soccer. I played baseball until I got into junior high and then everybody just grew fast and was better than me. Like I love sports. It's just, that I was never going to be good at. It. I was too little. I was like Randy Rhodes or Jakey e. Lee or any other little or Joe Perry. I was designed to be in a band. There was no room for me. And I was never going to be smart enough to be an engineer or a doctor. I was just an average kid who, you know, sometimes um, evolution and life just tells you what you need to do, right? It's like right. I'm 5'9", <laughs> a buck 25 when I graduated high school. Music's my thing, right? I mean, right. I, I guess I, you know, I was – and um, and I'm lucky because – I'm still doing what I love. And uh, I saw your, I saw your son. But, Tell him I said, hey. yeah, but, I saw <laughs> I'll tell, he'll come back in a minute. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to wave to him. That's funny. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And you know, like uh, you're not stuck in a cubicle, which is, which is pretty awesome. Cause you know, I couldn't imagine rich ward being in like an office job day to day, you know, you know, 55 working nine to five, you got it made, you know? Yeah. I, you know what? I could probably do it if I had done it my whole life, but it's kind of like taking an animal that's been wild its entire life and then putting it in your backyard in the cage. It just, it's like, I've already lived too much of my life this way. It's in the same way that I think someone who has worked in a cubicle or has had structure could not operate in this way because mm -hmm. some people just need structure. They need because that's the only thing they know. It's the same reason why when the, the wall fell in, in 88 and the Soviet Union basically 
freed all of these Soviet satellite states, people just didn't quite know what to do at first. Like they'd been, people had been telling them what to do for so long. They'd been under such tight constraints of how to live their lives that it just. Hey, buddy. What's up? up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just think, I think it's, you know, part of it's just kind of, um, you know, nature versus nurture kind of thing. I've just been doing this so long that it would be very difficult to. You know, I mean, if I had to do it, I would. I've told people all the time, if the bottom fell out of this thing and I needed to make sure that there was food on the table, I'd do whatever it takes. I'm like, I don't think there's anything menial about what people can see, consider menial labor. It doesn't, you know, like all jobs are good. It just yeah. depends on, you know, um, what do I need and what's it going to take for me to get it? And um, I've been lucky that. I mean, during COVID, I mean, the thing that kept me alive was that I had a, a hit single in Judas and I kept getting those checks. It mm. was like, it was the best thing it ever had. I'd never had a hit single, but the, it hit right before COVID. And when everything shut down and there was no touring and there was no money, I was so blessed. Tony Khan, the head of AEW, used that song as Jericho's entrance theme. And it kept that song alive because the average life shelf life of a single what you know if you're lucky mm -hmm. you went four five six months something like that on radio if you can get eight or nine months out of a single on radio you're lucky that song lasted for four years oh yeah you're because so it was on that. tv mm -hmm. i know it was on tv every wednesday and i've just been blessed that um and also i never had expensive habits you know i've never been a drug guy i've never been a fancy sports car guy i've never been a expensive anything i've i've kept myself pretty frugal because i know that you you have to prepare for the famine not the feast in this business and so i was i've, I've kind of set myself up for worst case scenario if the bottom falls out and now i'm in a position where um the guardians are doing really well not just success wise in uh, growing audience but financially things are really good and um you know uh, on one hand you can say we're selling out venues and packing buildings but uh people are like wow it's incredible I, I i wouldn't want to show everyone the receipts of the three years that i invested everything that i was making into it because just like your podcasting business mm -hmm. you don't launch any business from scratch without the first few years or do you just have to say i'm going to invest yeah. in this it's not going to bring any money in i'm going to put mm -hmm. what i can, i believe in this thing it, it doesn't matter if you're a race car driver or if you open an ice cream shop your your expenses are front loaded you know you you spend yeah. the money you put your heart and soul into it and if you believe it's going to happen then you make it happen uh dude i love the way you said that that, that i absolutely agree with that um I want to talk uh, just real fast about Fozzy. Um, your last song that you put out was Spotlight, correct? Was that that's the yes? Uh, just, that was a great song. And uh, are you guys going to release another song? I like the slow drip of of music that Fozzy's putting yeah. out. Thank you. Yeah, that that's kind of our uh, new formula, uh, and I think part of that just kind of comes down to um, Jericho is not a wrestling star. He's not a rock star. He's not a best selling author. He's now a movie star. Like he's in big films. Um, and his schedule is such that he's like the Terminator. Like he just doesn't sleep. And the minute that he gets off his cruise, J Chris Jericho, it doesn't say the Fozzie cruise or the AEW cruise. It's the Chris Jericho rock and wrestling rager or rocking wrestling rager. I mean, dude, he has his own cruise and it's sold out. <laughs> And then he gets off the boat and immediately goes to LA and then is immediately back for wrestling. It's like we have two days off a week when we're, when Fozzie's touring, it's always Tuesday and Wednesday. So he flies out after the show on Tuesday. So if it, well, depending on where we are, he'll fly out after the show private, he'll get on a private plane, fly home so that he can spend 
all day Tuesday with his family because he realizes this time is so important. His kids are young and having a day at home is important. He wants to take his kids to school, pick them up, have some normalcy. Even if it's just one day a week, he's with his kids and his wife. Then on Wednesday, he's got to fly out and wrestle. And then he gets up the next morning and flies out and meets us wherever we are on tour to play that night on tour and then stays with us for five days and repeats. And and, and then he's doing podcast. Yeah. He, he does podcast yeah, in the back of the house. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He's constantly working. And what he does is he tries to figure out what town am I in? Who lives in this town? So if we're in, you know, if we're in New Jersey, he'll call up Bubba Ray Dudley and say, hey, while I'm in town at the Stone Pony in Asbury Park, can I interview you for my podcast? He gets his friends in wherever city he's in. And he's just, he's always working. And part of that also means it's harder to get together and write records. It's harder to get together mm -hmm. and could we do it? Of course. But we're at the point where everything we do has to be a home run. There's no stand-up doubles allowed 25 years into Fozzie's career. I don't want to put out B-sides or okay. So I think we've got this idea that doing what Spotlight did. We wrote a fantastic song. I, it's one of my favorite songs we've done. Um, wow. And yeah, and we're just that's that's the idea. And I'm constantly presenting songs to Chris and to our producer Johnny. What do you think of this? And then try not to cry a river when they say, oh, "I love that." What else you got? And that's our <laughs> process. It's just you know working like that and trying to figure out how we can best the last song, whatever that means. You know, like um, I think we have personal metrics that we say whether a song is a success or not. But I um, generally that means, you know, we've got a bunch of songs that have been top 10. So I think we want to write songs that get in the top 10 on the charts, but also songs that we feel are true representations of who Fozzie is in 2024 uh, and songs that we can all be proud of, uh, songs that feel like Rich Ward on guitar and Billy Gray on lead guitar and, you know, Chris Jericho and lead vocals, not trying to be whatever's going on hip uh, because yeah. we'll never be able to keep up with the Joneses. You just can be the best version of you. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's been great. We would always love to tour more, um, yeah. but I can't, I can't tell my partner, don't go be a movie star. You know, uh, <laughs> don't go be the, the biggest name in professional wrestling minus maybe the rock. Um, like that's true. Like, yeah. You know, he's, this is built in. It's like baked into the cake. My relationship with him is that Ozzy is one of the things he does, which is why the guardians have been so important to myself and grant is that the more success that Jericho has and the more things that he has obligations to do business wise, it allows he, grant and I to have, uh, something to fulfill our purpose with so mm -hmm. that we're not just sitting on the sidelines, you know, uh, practicing at home or waiting for the next thing or whatever. Um, Fozzy provides a good uh, life for Grant and myself, uh, but we still want to play. You know, there's, yeah. there's still life left in the tires. We want to be on the track and, <laughs> you know, and, and, and until, you know, I know that Rush, when they said it was time, it's because two of the members in the band said it was time. It wasn't mm -hmm. one guy because Neil Peart goes to the guys and says it's time. And Alex Lyson says one more tour, you know. And, of course, Getty's sitting on the sidelines saying, I never want to stop. But when you're a band, you have to figure out when that time is for the band. And then you figure out what time it is for you as individuals to, to wrap it up. and. I still feel fantastic. Um, you know, I have all those things that every, you know, person over 50 who plays an instrument deals with. I've got low back pain. I've got some arthritis in their hands. The same thing at George Lynch and Corey Taylor and mm. everybody else who's ever done this, Phil and Selmo. We, we all do that because none of us are going to go out there and stand there and stare at our shoes. This is... Um, Every day is the Super Bowl. Every show is the Super Bowl. And we're all so lucky to do it that we would never punish 
the fans who are there that night uh, by phoning it in. They deserve 100% of everything that we have. So you suck it up. You take four Advil, you drink some green tea, and you go out there and you pretend like there's nothing going on. And when the show's over, you put some ice on your back. And you, you know, and the main thing is, is that my focus has been no Oxycontin, no painkillers. I've never taken them and I won't because I see what's happened to other musicians who have had back pain, other athletes who have had back pain and they start chasing that dragon. Um, for me, it's the thing that saved my life has been that DDP yoga, which I do every day. Yeah. Um, I'm very light. I don't lift weights anymore. I'm, I weigh 145 pounds. I used to weigh 205 when I was in Stuck Mojo. Oh, I yeah. Was really, I was, yeah. yeah, I was muscular and I realized that my – um, my frame can't sustain that kind of weight. Uh, and so I, I eat lean. I, I, I train every day and I, I don't do it because for vanity reasons, although I lifted weights in the nineties for vanity reasons, cause I wanted to be jacked like all my heroes. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to look like Henry Rollins, you know, I wanted to look like Glenn Danzig. These dudes, when I saw them on stage, it was like, Oh, they, they they looked as powerful as their music sounded. And mm. I always thought that was incredible. You know, when we tour yeah, the dude. typo negative and Pete Steele yes. would roll up the back of the truck and get in there and pump iron every yeah. day. I wanted to be just like Pete Steele because yeah. I realized he looked the way he sounded. It was, it reinforced the power of the music. Now, if I was in dream theater, it doesn't need to be that because dream theater is beautiful. It, it's, it's a different approach, but stuck mojo was a jackhammer. And it was a, it was something that was just rhythmically punishing you. And I wanted to look that part, which is why I trained the way that I did. And luckily for me, Jericho is always going to be the biggest guy in Fozzy. So I don't need to compete with him. I can be, <laughs> uh, I can be his, his skinny little partner. Right? He can be, uh, you know, the skipper and I can be Gilligan and <laughs> we can have a great relationship. Uh, I, I, I'm lucky. I've been very lucky in my career. Bones was one of the best front men in all of Absolutely. Uh, of crossover, new metal, whatever you want to call it. He was by far yeah. one of the best. And part of the reason was just because it was real. Like he, he was never trying to pretend to be anything. He was just that guy. Um, yeah. And it's cr the crazy thing about it is I never really understood it when I was younger. Um, you know, I was constantly worried about all the chaos that was created by that th that energy, not realizing that if you took it away, all the magic that was bones would have gone away too. Um, in the same way that nobody wants to see a, a a Boy Scout with a perfectly intact family and went to private school, they don't want to see them be the front man of a of a heavy metal band because they don't have any any. There's no pain and struggle and stories yeah. to tell. Bad news bears, broken, man. That just made me think of that. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You, you broken that. people, broken people make for great artists. Um, and yeah. and I don't wish that upon anybody. Um, you know, my dad was never around. I never thought it was abnormal because it was my life. I, I my stepbrother and I had bunk beds in my room. Um, we didn't have air conditioning when I was growing up. We would just crack the windows and put a fan in, in the, in the window. It just seemed normal to me. Like if you, if you're a kid, you don't think you're poor because you share a room with your stepbrother. I watched the Brady bunch. They didn't seem poor. And there was a crap ton of kids living in a couple of rooms in their house. And I just thought it was normal. And, but if you're, if you grow up comfortable and wealthy, and then all of a sudden you have to sleep on the floor of somebody you met that night at the venue because you don't have enough, your band doesn't have enough money to pay for a hotel. Life sucks. Like, you know, if you grew up in Canada in the winters and then all of a sudden you come down to Atlanta and during the winter, you don't have a jacket, doesn't bother you. I felt worse. I, you know, like I know yeah. what cold weather feels like. And I think, Part of the reason why a lot of musicians who succeed um, in this business 
what, why it's why this business is populated by broken people is just because the business is tough. But pe- these people have already experienced tough. They had tough lives. They've they've de- dealt with abuse and mm-hmm. and worse. I didn't deal with abuse, but I I did I did live what I now would if um, if you looked at it I you know through the prism of today I lived in a fairly lower middle class household, um, uh, but uh, I didn't think of it at the time if that makes sense. Yeah. You know what no, I mean? absolutely. You, I, yeah. yeah. Um, I had friends that were rich. But I just thought they were rich. I didn't think that that meant that I was poor. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so, um, so I think that's a good thing um, that that people who grow up with stories to tell and and not ideal childhoods they make for interesting artists. And it doesn't matter who it is. Look at all of them. Um, yeah. They all they're all a little broken or. It, the 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 clocks don't exactly run on time and yeah, uh, absolutely you know, I'm, yeah. I, I'm i'm a, and i'm a proud part of that community i i i'm glad mm-hmm. music was there for me it saved my life you know discovering judas priest when i was 12 years old saved my life it gave me something to focus on and something to listen to and um things to take my mind off of you know not feeling like i fit in not feeling like i had a you know i was never going to click with the in crowd and it gave me my own click. I found other people who like Judas priest. And then, you know, it made me through that little shelter of, you know, people who loved heavy metal was kind of my identity. You guys did that for us too. Stuck Mojo did that. I mean, I still have a group of friends that we all went and saw Stuck Mojo in Atlanta. We're all super young. We're still friends today. So we had a community like that creative loafing, like, when are they going to play next before internet? You know, yeah. I love that. that the last thing time, man, that was, magic it was, time. Man. it was, man. I, I, I love it. Last thing I, I, I'll, I'll say, and then we can uh, move on or we get in this, but, uh, your sound guy, Sam Abernathy, he's the man. How did you find Sam? He he's been with you for a while. Yeah. Sam was the house sound man at the One Twenty tavern in Marietta. And Fozzie uh, played a show there. And I had met Sam before then because he was in a band called Uber Stout. He was a local guitar player. And Sam is an incredible guitar player. Uh, And I met him, basically kind of became aware of him through him being the house sound man at this venue that Fozzie played in. And then we had several sound men that we had over the years. and, And Fozzie was looking for a sound guy. Uh, and this would have been probably 17 or 18, 2017, 2018, something like that. Uh, and uh, a friend of mine said, do you know Sam Abernathy? He was the house sound guy at 120 Tavern. He's a big Rich Ward fan. He came to, he used to go see Mojo play all the time at the Masquerade. And I think you guys would get along really good because you have similar interests and you're, you know, both kind of came up in the Atlanta music scene, different generation, but um mm-hmm same kind of dudes and uh we became great friends and now we're best friends and he's he's part of everything i do you know i don't we don't i don't get on a cruise ship or an airplane or go to australia or europe or la or whatever without it you know we you know and that's the and sam's the same as me he's like he's broken just like me we're good partners you know, we we do this because this is what we're supposed to do. And yes. Whatever it yeah. takes, that's what we're going to do. And Sam is a fantastic guitar player. He's a great engineer. He'll probably find himself making records um, with with other bands down the road. Uh, the his future is limitless. It's only based on whatever he decides to do because he's very talented. And he, he's yeah, dude. W- when we're on tour with Fozzie, he's the best guitar player in in the band, and he he's running sound. He's amazing. <laughs> and he plays every Monday, I think, at Dixie Tavern, or he's playing there all the time now. I see him. Yeah. You know, he's got his videos. own jam night at Dixie Tavern. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's a great guy. I've had him on the show. And, and he's a bigger Mojo fan than I am. I mean, he's like, I thought I knew Mojo, and he's like correcting me on lyrics and dates. I'm like, <laughs> you are the number one fan, dude. 
He's great, Rich, man. Yeah, he, he was at the shows, too. He was like, oh, I was at that show. I was at this show. I was at that show. Yeah. Was he? <laughs> yeah, he was there. He was. I think he was there during the Rising video when you guys were shooting that. You know, I, was, I wanted to he be was. there. But yeah. He That's was there great. at the heavy one, the heavy one album recording, the live album. I was there. Uh, show. Yeah, I was there too. Yes, nice. Yeah, I remember that night. That was a great night. Oh my gosh, that live album! It means the world. I actually bought that recently. It was on sale. I bought the vinyl. It was cool to well, have, it, you know. Yeah, Century Media licensed it. I've got a few copies of it. I haven't started promoting it yet because I was like, I always feel weird when my social media accounts all feel like I'm selling something, like. Come yeah. see Fozzie on the Jericho boat. Oh, by the way, come see Guardians. We're playing here. Oh, by the way, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuck I've got a new album out. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, you know, yeah, I, yeah, anytime I feel like I'm being spammed to death, it reminds me, don't do it yourself. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, now that the, the Fozzie stuff has simmered down a little bit, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advertise about it. But it's a company that Century Media licensed – uh, and I think it may be multiple albums. We may actually go oh, back wow. and do, yeah. Oh, it'll be please. really cool. That's so great. I, uh, I don't have I any space. It. I have no space on my walls, but I'll find space to frame it. I may have to take some stuff what, down. And, you know. What vinyl are you missing from Stuck Mojo? Um, so I, I definitely have the first one. I have I have uh, Pig Wall. I think I got them all. Yeah, yeah. Now that you say that. Oh, the um the last Stuck Mojo album, no, the last one with Bones. I don't think I have that on vinyl. Um, I can't think of the uh the album name. Declaration, name of, the album. Declaration of a Headhunter. De yes, yes yeah, that's I, the one I, I don't. Have. I don't have that one either. That's the one I don't have either. So I'll try okay. to find this two, or I'll try to talk him into reissuing it. Yeah, that would be. I don't have a copy. Yeah, that's the only yeah. one I don't have. I, I've I've signed some copies of it, but I've never owned one. I should have oh, really? been like mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mine. <laughs> Well, Rich, man, thank you so much for being on my podcast. This means a lot to me. You know, uh, yeah, you're a great a person. I love too. talking to you. You're motivating. Man, I like I want to do things. No, thank you so much. That means the world. And I uh, appreciate hey, it, man. We'll, I'm looking uh, forward. Yeah, yeah next time we'll uh, we'll we'll sit down together. I'll bring my uh, I'll bring my my bump box remix. Where my finger? Yeah, uh, yes. and bring mine, and we'll we'll set them next to each other and have a remix bump box wars. Dude, that'd be awesome, man. Yeah, my yeah. neighbors will love it. <laughs> the whole neighborhood <laughs> will hear it. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I love you. I love you, Scott. Have a wonderful night, man. It's great talking with you. I love you too, brother. Thank you so much for doing this, man. It means the world. Yeah, my privilege, brother.